All right, we welcome you to another episode of Learning Stories. This is a show where we profile a diverse set of learners from the 21st century. In each episode of this show, we interview a guest who has a story to share about how they acquired a set of skills and knowledge in a creative and innovative manner. In the process, we hope to uncover a new understanding of learning as conceptualized, imagined, and narrated by the guest on our show. Today's guest, Nikhil Kure, is somebody I've known for a long time. Um, we were in school together in Bahrain. But a little bit about his background before we jump into this conversation about his journey. Nikhil is a 28-year-old based out of Pune, India. Nikhil is a proud cat dad, plays hours of badminton weekly, a voracious reader, and he's extremely curious around all things human behavior, decision-making, game theory, and generally around what makes us tick and the world tick. He loves going to bed with more questions than answers on a daily basis and is a self-professed generalist and is a computer science engineer by education. So his educational background is in the field of computer science, um, but he has uh, expanded to include a lot of areas in this uh, category to, uh, cre to, to reach where he is today. Since 2019 though, Nikhil has been building an open data company called Finarcane, and they've been instrumental in building, scaling, and driving adoption for the next wave of India's public digital infrastructure around open finance, health, and identity. As the co-founder and CEO of Finarcane, Nikhil now wears multiple hats, and each new day brings a new learning experience. So Nikhil, thanks for that wonderful introduction. You know, I, um, I'm really excited to talk about your current venture, but I'd like to start this conversation off by actually uh, going back in the day. You know, what was Nikhil like as a student at school? What were some of the subjects you were interested in? And uh, what were some of the memories you have from school? Hey, hey, Avi. Uh, glad we are finally doing this. And, and you know, thank you for that intro. Uh, it's, that was amazing. Awesome. So... So how was Nikhil like in school, right? So a so couple of points. First of all, I I probably shifted schools every three or four years. Mm. Um, so I've been in school in you know in in Surat in India. I've been in schools in uh, Aurangabad again in India. I've had a couple of uh, my my formative years in in Saudi in in Yanbu. Um, and, uh, and funnily enough, I, I just spent one year, uh, I think less than a year actually in Bahrain. Wow. Um, so I was just, there just, just for 11th grade and, uh, <laughs> yeah. And then I, I, and then I ended up, uh, doing one year in, in Pune and then, uh, I've been in Pune since from, from, you know, 2012. So, um, yeah, I've, I've just moved around a lot, um, initially during, during my school years and, um, it's you know I back back then I, I had some resent, resentment around it because you know I would see people um, you know people like you obviously who who've been in the same place um, pretty much same school all your life and I mean, you you have a, a amazing sort of social circle and and you know uh, you 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 essentially end up having a reset every time you sort of you know shift uh, cities, states, countries, continents. I know moving around can be challenging, as you mentioned, but I think it also gives you the skills to understand and build social relationships in every new context. You know, it's just like moving a new job. You know, the fact that you were able to move to new countries and make those changes, I think it's amazing. And it speaks a lot about your ability to adapt and change based on the needs of the situation. But, you know, how did you decide to uh, choose computer science as uh, a subject you wanted to study? You know, after 11th and 12th, you directly moved into studying um, an engineering degree. So what was, uh, what was your thought process behind making that decision? Yeah, so, so the, the, the probably the, the cliched answer is, you know, I've always been big into, uh, you know, computer gaming and, and, and all of that. But really, um, you know, what clicked was um, as early as I think seventh or, or eighth grade, uh, we, we actually had a programming uh, at, at a school um, uh, in, in Aurangabad, right? And uh, logic was something that really clicked for me. Um, I was, I, I really enjoyed math. And, uh, but but I, I knew that even, even, you know, as early as eighth grade, 
I, I I try to to you know just skip ahead a bit and try to understand that you know if I really want to double down on math long term, um you know what would that look like? Mm-hmm. And I knew that you know uh, math, um middle school even calculus and and you know all of that is is great, um and you know probably something that I will ace. But uh, the 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 ex- the curve is extremely exponential once you 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 know get into um, uh, you know graduate or, or uh, graduate mathematics and, and you know if you really choose to double down there and uh, I I knew you know I would probably be out of my depth and and so um, computer science you know uh, when when I formally had it as a subject from from eighth grade uh, really seemed like a a cheat code of sorts, you know, where I could still hang on to to math while uh, you know um, finding somebody else to do the you know do the heavy lifting while while I just provide the the logic of it, right? And and um, you know, folks who who enjoy um, solving say puzzles or uh, just just you know a bunch of logical things, I think um, it, it's it's a great uh, career option. And uh, honestly, not everyone is is built for it. Um, you know, you can you can have mediocre programmers getting by, you know, making a decent living, and and you know, just just um, riding it out also, right? And, and that's okay. But if you if you're really passionate about it, um, you know, uh, it it's an amazing opportunity. And and uh, as we as we can see, you know, clearly technology is um, eating the world. Um, so. Uh, so yeah, uh, so that's that's essentially was my first sort of exposure to to computer science, and and I just um, you know kept on uh, doubling down on it, and uh, and so you know when when I graduated um, from high school, it, it seemed like a no brainer going for computer science. Wonderful, yeah, and I I think that's so important that you were able to make that insight and make that connection at such a young age, you know, in terms of distinguishing between core math and maybe looking at a more applied discipline in terms of computer science being your area of expertise, you know, but like, what do you learn in a four-year computer science course, Nikhil, just to give the viewers a little bit of an understanding of your training um, as a computer engineer, like how is the course structured and how is that broken down? And how did those skills that you learned in that course, how did they help you in your professional journey? So if you could just tell us how the course is broken down to start off with, that would be great. Okay, so so it, it's been a while since since I've, I've you know been back to college and uh, I, I graduated in 2016. Uh, so so you know let me give you an overview of, of what I remember, right? Um, so you you start with a, a foundational layer of sorts on the first year, which which you know gives you um, a, a, you know exposure to to multiple sort of engineering subjects, uh, you know everything from electrical to to even civil and, and you know a couple of other branches and then subsequently the other three years is is where you really specialize including um in the uh, you know um in the final two years you also have a couple of electives and and, and specialization choices and and ability to you know go for uh, industry internships right so so it, it's a depending on obviously the university you end up at um it, it can be a very hands-on or a, a very hands-off approach but the really the beauty of of you know at least for computer science is that honestly, even even the best of professors um, in in you know computer science uh, probably have content um, including their lectures, their lessons, you know all all available online. And and really you'll find amazing um, you know tutorials and 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 content um, to to you know pick up on computer science. It, it's probably one of the most accessible fields to, to you know dip your toes in but conversely um you know it, like like the the curve of d- distribution um is is you know very steep and and what i mean by that is going from you know uh, entry level computer science to to you know really um somebody who's who's decent at it to, to somebody who's, who's you know absolutely uh, great at it to to like you know somebody who's a, a savant um, the, the the gaps are just really massive um, so, so therefore, what your engineering experience, um, and you know, I'm, I'm talking about the the Indian uh, context here, yep. um, because that's that's you know what what I can comment on. Yep. 
um, is that the at least you know back when I was in engineering, the the content was was uh, the course content was fairly outdated. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what is expected uh, once you get out there and in the industry versus the concepts that we were learning, where you know uh, th there was a, a a mismatch there. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's that's you know how it was uh, back then, and uh, since since then you know the the universities are taking efforts to actually. Uh, periodically revise um, their their curriculum and and you know actually get industry inputs. Um, so so that's shaping up well. So so here's how you know uh, you should expect an ideal um, you know a, a four year course. It should have sort of three or four four things. Mm -hmm. One is you need to get the fundamentals of thinking um, in a logical manner right, um, and that's something that. Uh, is very difficult to teach, um, you know, I would say. Um, and it, it's not something that, you know, like uh, I, I've heard a couple of, um, you know, people who, who I, I respect and admire and who've done great in the field, um, you know, um, talk about things like you're either born with it or you're not. And, um, you know, I, I, I do not think that's really fair. I, I believe there's a spectrum, um, you know, um, and, and uh, everyone is, is, is going to have, um, you know, a level at which they they top out essentially, yeah. um, and then that's okay. You know there are opportunities um, at at each of those stages, um, but but point is you know uh, that's that's the one thing you should try to name. Um, you know your your basics of logic and and ability to to think in an efficient uh, and an optimized manner. Yeah. And and again, uh, I won't go too technical, but um, the the one of the ways you you measure, um, you know how how well have you say programmed this is uh, what is known as space and time complexity. Mm -hmm. um, so again, it, it sounds um, you know uh, obviously complex, but you know I, I'll I'll break it down. Um, space complexity is essentially your you know how much space is the code um, you're writing really going to take to to you know execute. Or, or solve a given problem mm. and uh, space is clearly a, a constraint for us yeah. you know um, we, we we buy phones with limited um, storage and and so you know um, ideally um, when you write efficient code which takes up less space that is good right so so that's that's one core concept mm -hmm. and the other core concept is what is known as time complexity and and again um, the idea here is how quickly can your program run how quickly can you know the, the code you're writing actually um, solve the problem uh, that you're you're looking to solve? So so these are the sort of uh, this is the other basic that you know you really should try to to nail um, you know in, in your uh, college. And and lastly, uh, you know programming by nature, especially uh, um, during your college, is should be a collaborative experience. Mm. Everyone around mm. you is is going to be at different stages, but you should definitely uh, collaborate and, and you know try to to you know help each other out and uh, things like uh, pair programming uh, where you know two people sort of uh, program together is is now catching on the broader industry. But um, it's it, it it was always an option, right? And and I, I would strongly recommend that that's you know the the other thing you should really uh, go for. Um, otherwise, you know, just just work. Sorry, just just one last thing. You know, yeah. um, you should you should get um, internships and, and real world experience, um, ideally in your college if if you can, because um, again, in the Indian context, you know what you you learn inside the classrooms versus um, just the the paradigm uh, you know in the industry uh, was misaligned when mm. when I was in, in in college. So so that's you know the the last step. Yeah, that's, that's amazing, Nikhil. I think you summarized it so well. And I think for anyone that's interested in making a career in this field, you actually gave them like a small sheet code uh, of some of the things they need to really understand to be able to get the most out of that course. And I think what you mentioned about the, uh, the amount of knowledge you learn in the course and the amount that is required by the industry, there's a huge gap. I feel like technology in general is one of those industries where and computer science in particular is one of those industries where knowledge is changing on a day-to-day -day basis, right? You have 
uh, new languages, uh, new ways to program coming out almost every day. And I think as someone that is working in the field, I assume you have to be on top of these developments on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's interesting that you know you share those observations that are so important in the context today. But um, you know, Nikhil, once you were done graduating your course, there are two pathways for anyone uh, you know with a degree like yours. You know, take up a really high-paying job in the tech industry as a working professional, or also look at the entrepreneurial pathway in terms of other opportunities. I feel like, like, how did you navigate that path? You know, were there professional experiences you took up or was it Finarkin right from the start for you? Yeah, so, so you know, uh, I, so funnily enough, I, I actually wanted to go for a, a master's in the US. Um, I applied uh, in my third year of engineering. Um, I didn't get any of the admits, uh, not, not one admit, right? And, uh, Second time around after after my graduation, I applied once more. I got a couple of admits, but um, you know, for, for whatever reasons, um, I, I felt you know I, I deserved better. Mm -hmm. And uh, in terms of the universities, you know, uh, that that you know I was getting accepted into, and and so I decided to, to you know wait a year out. Uh, but but what ended up happening was that because I was so confident uh, that you know I will I will get in into the university of my choice. I, I never really, um, you know, attended any of the uh, university placement opportunities. So mm -hmm. I didn't have a job after I graduated for about a month or so. Okay. And, and and that's when, you know, the, the final uh, sort of university I was waiting out for responded with, you know, and that, you know, you do not make the cut. Right? Mm -hmm. So so that's, that's when um, I, I really started looking for a job. But again, you know, what helped me was that I had done an internship in a, in a company, uh, you know, uh, prior during, during my engineering. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so I reached out to those folks and, and because they'd already worked with me and, uh, and, you know, they'd, they'd seen my work, I, I luckily, you know, got an opportunity to, to, you know, go for an interview and, and, you know, uh, that, that really came through for me. Got right. It. So, so that's, that's essentially how I ended up, um, you know, working in a, a business intelligence kind of company here uh, in Pune uh, for the next three years from 2016 to, to you know, August 2019. Mm -hmm. That's that's amazing. And I think that opportunity, it's interesting, you know, because a lot of people uh, also look up at, look at higher education as an opportunity, but I think working in an actual company and organization can be an education in itself, right? And I think it also helps you observe how your skill can be translated into the real world context and applied in a particular market uh, like area. So like, was it, was it this time where you were observing different trends in the industry and like, uh, what was the service that this company was providing, you know, without naming names, what was like the main service and how did you make that transition from, you know, working in an organization to, observing that there is something that you can create on your own that may be uh, really valuable in a larger context. Because I'm really interested in your entrepreneurial journey, Nikhil, you know, like what is the thought process behind taking that leap? And how do you observe problems that can be solved? And how did you find that gap as an entrepreneur? Right, so, so you know, um, let's, let's, you know, take it from, from essentially uh, you know, how, how I, I sort of ended up here, right? Uh, and, and, you know, just dialing it right back to, to after uh, my, my college and, you know, joining my first job. So I ended up joining, um, you know, one of the, the best teams uh, there, uh, you know, where, where the smartest, uh, you know, I mean, they're, they're smart people all around, but, but uh, you know, just folks who are working in the data engineering and, and, and sort of data science team, at this company is 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 you know where um, I I ended up joining and um, and my my first realization you know um, when when I met them was that uh, you know I, I used to think I am uh, a fairly adept uh, programmer and uh, you know these guys just just blew me uh, out of <laughs> I, I I felt you know I was way out of my depth. Yeah. And, uh, but, you know, it, you, you ultimately grow into the kind of company, um, you know, you keep, right. I, I, I think that's, uh, that's, that's really where getting into the, the right university helps, 
um, you know, it, 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 it's, it's the kind of network you, you sort of, um, you know, come across, right. Sure. But yeah, so, so going back to, to you know, um, my, my company. So this is, this is where in, in this team, eventually I, I met folks who ended up, you know, being my co-founders, right. Okay. So all, all senior people, um, you know, older than me, uh, from a couple of years to, you know, uh, much, uh, much more. Yep. Right. And, uh, yeah, so uh, so that's that's essentially um, you know where, where I met my co-founders and and you know while the the company was doing something uh, very different in in a domain um, you know that's uh, that's more around manufacturing and and uh, you know aerospace and and you know uh, uh, very different sectors mm-hmm. but but obviously you know it it dealt with data and uh, yeah so so that's that's where. Um, I, I I sort of met met these guys and Amazing. and uh, uh, what I saw was that they had a lot of pent up creative energy Got it. and uh, yeah. you know uh, <laughs> uh, outlet was was very much needed and and so 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 that's that's where I I you know um, joined a, a couple of these guys and you just you know have have these hacks or you know hackathons kind of um, experiences where you know we will just get together and, and you know just, just um look at interesting problem statements beyond um a day job and, and you know try to understand um you know what what we can do about it right and uh, that, so yeah. so that's that's essentially the the origin story more or less that's that's amazing like two things i'm noticing from your story nikhil is that you reached out to people in your field that were much more competent or had so much knowledge about that and that sort of uh, transferred onto your development it actually increased your learning curve significantly because you were looking at someone like uh, beyond your extended university peers you were also looking at professionals that spent a long time in the field and i think that was really helpful for you but also the space where all of you are bouncing ideas off each other would have been a really creative breeding ground for possible ideas because all of you had a lot of technical expertise and uh, you had five or six brains working on you know the same problem uh, which could have le- led to a lot of interesting you know conversations and results so um, in in a few sentences you know nikhil tell me what finarkin uh, uh, does as a company and uh, what are uh, some of the services you offer, you know, for someone uh, that is just listening to your, listening to this for the first time? Sure. So, so, uh, you know, before we, we get there, just very quick background. Um, uh, in, in 2017, uh, October 2017 or, or rather in um, September 2016, RBI, the, the India's, uh, you know, um, central bank, uh, essentially came out with with one last sort of uh, circular slash um, you know uh, communication uh, under the the governor uh, you know uh, Mr. Rajan mm-hmm. and and that was essentially what sort of laid the the uh, framework or uh, you know the the foundation for a open finance initiative mm-hmm. right and uh, and so you know we will we'll dive into each of these terms you know what is open finance open data and um, all these suspects, but, you know, fast forward to November, 2017, RBI's IT team came out with the first, um, or, or rather the first sort of mainstream revised uh, version of the specification. So you can think of it this way that um, taking that circular from 2016, um, RBI's IT arm came out with a, a, a protocol or, or a blueprint of sorts as to how we would enable open finance in India. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and that's really when, uh, you know, we got hooked and, uh, you know, I, I, I tried to figure out who are the people who, who, who you know, who are, who are driving this initiative and, and, you know, can we help out and, um, and you know, how can we contribute and, and that sort of led us down that entire path, right? So, so now let's, let's, you know, fast forward a, a couple of years and, and, you know, um, uh, you know, let's, let's talk about what, what we do as a company, right? Sure. So Finarkin uh, does two things. One is uh, we continue to to build out a lot of these protocols. Um, so a protocol is 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 like a, a blueprint of of say uh, it, it's a series of steps or, or you know instructions as to how do you go about say doing a particular task. This, this task can be 
um, exchanging of data. It can be uh, communication. It can be something around security, cyber security, right? Um, so, so the common examples that we use every day includes, say, HTTPS, right, which is a protocol on, on our browsers, on our websites, or, or you know, we use um, uh, the Internet Protocol IP, right? Mm -hmm. uh, literally, this is what is, or, or you know, uh, uh, right. So, so uh, these are a bunch of protocols, uh, you know, um, and, and something similar was built around Open Finance, right? So, mm -hmm. so what is Open Finance? Open Finance is 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 a all encompassing it's an all encompassing sort of term for um, you know technologies to enable sharing of financial data uh, mm -hmm. from say manufacturers of financial services to, to you know other manufacturers and, and say, entities who want to use this data mm -hmm. and, and again you know, let's break that down also uh, a manufacturer of financial service would be say a bank uh, you know a bank offers you a checkings account or a a savings account, or it can be, um, you know, um, uh, investment company like a, a Fidelity or something, mm -hmm. or, or you know, it, it, it can be an insurance company, or, or um, it, it can be a Robinhood, um, right? So, so these are manufacturers, um, and, and then subsequently on the other end, um, you know, entities where you want to say use this financial data. So, mm -hmm. when do you typically use financial data? It's probably when you are looking for again financial service right so either you you're looking for a credit you know you're applying for a credit card or you, you know you, you're looking to finance a car or a bunch of things right or, or it can be personal finance you want to know where you're spending mm -hmm. um and, and you're just staying on top of your finances or it can be something around applying for a new insurance policy it can be filing your taxes you have to share a bunch of documentation you know when you say file your taxes every year right so so this is uh, the the idea here is that historically financial data was siloed with with each of these manufacturers, mm. and open finance is is how you 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 know lay a, a a blueprint for seamless exchange of this data. Got it. Um, and and what India's uh, protocols are doing very uniquely different, uh, which is not done you know pretty much anywhere else in the world, is that. Um, there is a, a neutral, you know, third party consent manager of sorts mm -hmm. where we can explicitly manage just our data consents, you know, like where have I shared my financial data okay. and you know, ability to, to subsequently, um, you know, uh, just, just manage my consents and, and be aware of where I'm sharing my data, revoke it. If I want to, you know, if I stop using the service, why should that service keep having access to my data? Right. For sure. So, um, so all of these things, um, you know, is, is what, uh, the open finance protocol in India uh, enables, and um, I, I hope that wasn't a, a too uh, a technical answer. No, that was great, Nikhil. I think you did a great job just summarizing how um, this data can be used in so many beneficial ways for um, not only the, the manufacturers of those services, but also for other entities that may benefit. But I think the important point you mentioned is consent, right? The customer knowing uh, how that data is going to be used and having a say in that uh, in that relationship. I think that builds an ethical conversation around sharing of data um, across uh, stakeholders. And I feel like that is a very positive step. And I think creating the protocol with those ethics in mind, I think uh, sets the norm for what this can be. And I think it's amazing that your team is sort of pioneering this approach for open data and open finance. But I think your protocols will also fall into other industries like open health or open education um, in open logistics in so many other ways. So I feel like uh, it's amazing that you're able to do that uh, through your work as a, a startup and a company. But, you know, Nikhil, I, I, I know there are two other podcasts where you go into depth about, you know, how Finarkin is doing this. And I highly recommend to the listeners that um, that is something you should listen to to follow up this conversation. Nikhil is also available on social media platforms uh, um, to, to speak to about his work with Finarkin. Now, just in terms of uh, respect, uh, in respect to time, you know, um, in addition to Finarkin, like you've been a close observer of the Indian uh, technology sector. Are there any other entrepreneurs or other startups you feel are doing interesting work um, that you uh, are inspired by? And, um, you know, anything that you have noticed about the uh, tech sector in India or in the world in particular 
that is uh, standing out for you in terms of the larger horizon? Yeah, so so there's a company called Postman, which which does you know really great work. I mean, it's it's a massive company now, uh, but um, it it it's a developer tool essentially, and uh, but you know what what really um, you know um, gets you know it, it, it's both something that drives me and and also something that um, you know I think is is changing very rapidly is that we come across a lot of these memes or, or you know uh, forwards around you know, uh, persons of Indian origin sort of running big tech, but, you know, sort of no, no big tech in, in India. And, and you know, uh, most of the, the Indian sort of mainstream startup companies um, have been sort of tech enabled um, services, right? Or, you know, like uh, ed tech or um, e-commerce or, and then, you know, don't, don't get me wrong. These are, these are massively difficult problems and, you know, they've been, amazing technology and they're obviously solving, um, you know, critical problems, but, um, you know, I, I strongly feel that the kind of technical talent uh, India has and, um, you know, uh, big tech companies from India, you know, run by Indians building for the world is happening. Mm. And, you know, there are a couple of uh, companies out there. Um, you know, I, I'm sure your listeners have heard of Zoho again, uh, you know, that's, that's uh, amazing example of you know what what um, the team behind zoo has been able to achieve so so yeah um, these are sort of like the companies that and, and there are plenty of other examples you know there, there's a puna uh, sort of based company called druva again they're doing you know great work around uh, cloud security um, uh, so you you are getting these deep tech and and you know pure tech uh, sort of plays now coming up and uh, yeah, and and uh, like like you mentioned, you know, technology pretty much goes through a churn every every two to three years. If and you know, definitely uh, a decade down the line, <laughs> everything just just you know um, you know changes. And and uh, a key enabler has been just the the fact that you know the one metric that has really got optimized is a um, computing power, right? Mm-hmm. So so because of what is known as Moore's law. Um, every every uh, you know couple of years or so, we've been able to really shrink um, the the processor dice. Um, so so again, without getting too technical there, the, what, you know what what that enables is it enables us to um, you know do more with um, more efficiently with lower power, power consumption. Uh-huh. And uh, and you know it, it's essentially every time you you buy an iPhone, you know it has a new chip. It is actually, you know, uh, built uh, on on like a a new new technology. It, it it's like smaller and it's shrinking and it just enables uh, more efficiency. So so you know while the battery size necessarily sort of um, you know stays the same, you end up um, you know getting more performance out of the the same size sort of phone, right? So that's that's been sort of one enabler. The other enabler has been uh, with, with the advent of cloud technology, um, you know, something like AWS or uh, Google Cloud or, or, you know, Microsoft's Azure platform. Um, the cost to, to, you know, build a new technology and, and, you know, rapidly deploy it and scale it um, has been, has become, you know, very affordable. You do not need to buy bulky servers or uh, a lot of hardware infrastructure. Mm-hmm. Anyone who can, you know, it, uh, anyone, even a one person, you know, you, you can easily set up a one person, uh, you know, software company with with you know a uh, decent recurring revenue of uh, you know even a few million uh, mm. um, if, and uh, it, it's entirely doable by one person today, right that's uh, so so that's that's essentially what's you know been driving this this entire wave that's amazing Nikhil. i think that's a great positive note to end this conversation you know i think there's so much more i'd like to chat with you about and i feel like i know you've done other podcasts where you've broken it down in more detail but i really feel that is a good vision um, you know for technology in not just the developed world but even in developing countries i think more startups need to be uh, you know bred and completely run in um, countries like india china indonesia brazil um, and i feel like uh, because we have so much talent in uh, in countries around the world, not everyone needs to move to you know a particular geography to actually get access to those opportunities. And I feel like with your story, you are actually enabling and creating that path. You know that um, I think 
by building a, like a software company and, and making it um, what it is today. I think you have showed that it is possible to you know, build uh, ecosystems and networks in uh, an environment that has that talent. And I think I'm really excited for your journey, Nikhil. I think Finarkian is doing amazing work. I hope I'm able to have this chat with you again in the near future. But I, uh, for the listeners, please do follow Finarkian and Nikhil on um, all available social media platforms. I will be linking um, some of Nikhil's other podcasts and uh, some articles related to Finarkian in the show notes. But Nikhil, any final words before we end the conversation today? Um, yeah, I would like to end on, you know, just, just be curious, right? Um, that, you know, there are a lot of inefficiencies in the world around us and, uh, you know, just, just be open to, to, you know, being curious and, uh, and, you know, acknowledging them, uh, you know, not, you, you don't need to go out and solve everything. Yep. Um, but, you know, just, just take a moment and, and, you know, just, just admire that and um and yeah uh, so that's that's you know what i would love to end on thank you thank you nikhil and for the listeners stay tuned uh, for more such episodes from this show and until then uh, keep learning